um, yeah, I, I, the first thing I was thinking was how um, how you and I started training in the 80s. We um, actually first met, uh, God, it must have been like 81 or 82. Um, and uh, you know, we were just starting out in, in geriatrics and had all these you know, dreams of, of, of how our system would change over the years and how we, would, we were just going to you know, find better ways to be more responsive. Um, and it, it's, it's so hard to hear these stories continue because that's how we started out hearing those stories um, in the 80s for, for, for me and, and for Diane. And, so to, to sit here today in 2013 is, is sort of sad. And, and um, so I have, I have to just say that, to recognize it, because I'm just sitting there very sad, thinking you know, someone being restrained and, and someone not following an advanced directive. And, you know, and, and that you, you didn't even, that what Heather, who's a, a colleague of mine, is a very, very smart woman who um, you know, didn't understand half of what was going on in that situation, in that, in that important moment, that important time in your life with your parent and, and didn't even understand half of it and, and, still, and you still question it. You know, you're still thinking, um, what happened there? What, what, I don't understand it. And that just says so much about our health system. And, you know, and, and never into blaming individuals, but this system that, that you know, continues to, to not be responsive and not promote conversations and, and discussion and, and just even hearing you know, the huddle of the, you know, the, the residents and I can see the huddle of the nurses and there's no blame on disciplines here um, you know, and, and thinking about yeah, we'll go over and talk about it and then we'll come and give you a few, few words and you have to make some literally life and death choice or some choice that's going to carry with you forever because um, it's your it's that moment. I always think that we're so fortunate to be, to, to always have that, to, to, to have a job where you're in the most intimate moments of somebody's life and you can make such a difference. And yet some of our colleagues, you know, because of our system, um, are not doing that in the way that I think all of us would hope so. So that's, I, that's how, I, I, you know, that's was just my first reactions, but, mm -hmm. Thinking about um, Diane, what you think about how you know how are we going to do this? I mean, I, I'm sitting here in 2013, and we're, yeah. we're, we're, both of us work very hard in organizations that are trying to change this. Right. So my blood pressure it went higher and higher as each story was yeah. being told. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I was trying to do deep breathing and mm -hmm. deep <laughs> cleansing breaths. <laughs> right, and, right. Well, you know, so. I think the first thing I want to say is the system is perfectly designed to get these results. Mm -hmm. The system is structured to get these results. Mm -hmm. It isn't the fault of individual doctors or nurses or social workers or families or patients. We're all working in a system that has its own logic which has very little to do with what matters most to patients and families. And the logic of the system is actually driven by how we pay for things. <coughs> and fear of lawsuits. So why did the nursing home take someone who had a fall that didn't affect him? Why were they worried about the possibility of a brain injury um, and think that he needed an evaluation in the ED? Well, because if, God forbid, he did have a brain injury and an intracranial hemorrhage from hitting his head and the nursing home failed to have that evaluated, there's huge risk management consequences for them. So they are protecting their butts, and it's quite realistic. Families sue nursing homes all the time for things like this. Nursing homes have a financial margin of negative. Mm -hmm. Nursing homes are constantly struggling against inadequate reimbursement and very high staffing requirements and costs. A lawsuit can cause a place to close. Okay, so it's very logical what the nursing home did in that construct. It was protecting the nursing home. And not to say protecting the nursing home because people are trying to make a profit, but protecting the nursing home from closing, having to fire people, having to lay off people. There's no bad actors here. This is what I'm trying to get at. 
you know, it's kind of how we pay for things. Then he gets to the emergency room, and the presumption is, the presumption is to do everything possible to restore people to health. The presumption is the person is in the emergency room for that reason. Otherwise, why would they be in the emergency room? Now, let's think about what we would want if we showed up in the emergency room. We want that presumption, right? We want the emergency room not to spend time thinking, is this a life worth investing in? Maybe not. So we'll move over to that other person over there. What kind of emergency room system do all of us want? We want one that errs on the side of presumption of protecting our lives and supporting our lives. Do we want emergency room interns and residents deciding that one person's life is not worth the investment, but another's is? Probably not. So the system errs on the side, and probably correctly, errs on the side, once you come to an acute care hospital, errs on the side of trying to prolong, protect your life, your one precious, irreplaceable life. How could something like this, therefore, have been prevented? What kind of system would we need that would have before your father fell, made sure that these conversations had taken place with you and your sister and your kids and your mom about what happens if, what happens if your dad falls? What happens if he gets pneumonia? What happens if he has a hip fracture? What should we, because the odds of that eventually are 100%, right? So it's something that could and should have been discussed at the moment of admission to that assisted living facility, in which you would have been able to choose a bunch, a bunch of options. And some people would say, I want everything possible done to prolong my life because I believe in miracles. Or having my husband with me even though he's demented, or having my wife with me even though she's very seriously ill, is infinitely precious to me. I want you to do everything you can to keep her with me, despite her poor quality of life. That's a choice. Most people don't make that choice, I have to tell you, when offered the choice, but about 5 to 10% do. 90% make a different choice. 90% say, if I'm at a point where I'm not going to recover to be able to interact meaningfully with my loved ones, I want comfort measures only. Nine out of 10 people say they want that. When they are asked, mm -hmm. they have to be asked. They have to be asked in a way that makes, that isn't threatening, that isn't saying, I think you're going to die tomorrow, so what do you want? Rather, the way I have these conversations is I'll say, I have this conversation with all my patients, and I usually do it with the family in the room. Same time I have the conversation about seat belts, vaccines, colonoscopy, mammography, things like that, just routine preventive care. So first thing I say is I have this conversation with all my patients, which reduces the threat level of the conversation. Right? And the second thing I say is, Every one of us, at some point or another, is likely to get to a point where we cannot make our own decisions. Either I could leave here today and get hit by a truck and be in a coma and unable to make my own decisions, or more likely, during old age, I'm going to have chronic diseases. Many of us will have some form of dementia, um, memory loss. And I want to talk to you about what kind of decisions you would want me and your family to make under those circumstances. So, then the first thing I say is, let's imagine you are in a situation where you are in a permanent coma, having been hit by a truck, or you had very advanced dementia, and we're never going to recover to a meaningful level of function or, and interaction. Imagine that situation. Some of my patients say, in that situation, they would want everything humanly possible done to prolong their life no matter what its quality. And others of my patients say, if they were in that situation, they would want care focused primarily on their comfort. Which kind of person are you? Now, why is that a good conversation? It doesn't create a value judgment, right? 
I am not biased when I present that choice. I understand that for some people, some religions, some cultures, vitalism, life itself is the ultimate value. It is not my job to decide that that's not an appropriate value or that that's an unfair value or that's a costly value. My job is to articulate those choices so that people can make a, a rational choice. And as I said, 90 to 95% say I want comfort measures only in that situation. If that conversation was had with the millions and millions of advanced dementia patients and their families before they got to this point, mm -hmm. your father would not have ended up in the emergency room. Now, your mother, very different situation, she made a conscious, rational decision to go for these surgeries. Mm -hmm. She understood the benefits and risks. It was her choice. Obviously, the goal was to restore her to, to the ability to walk. What could be more important to a quality of life than the ability to walk? I understand why she made those choices, why she was hopeful that she would be restored to the ability to walk independently. When you ask older people what is their number one priority and you, re and you give them three choices, remaining independent, um, quality of life, that is relief from pain and other symptoms, and the third one being staying alive, let me, let me ask the audience to guess which comes in first. Independence. Independence, 79%, first choice. What comes second? Quality of life. Quality of life. Dead last? <laughs> Staying alive. <laughs> but we, yes, yes, a deliberate choice of words. Right. But so the, mm -hmm. how is the healthcare system designed? On the third. All the resources, all the resources are focused on paying for acute care in the hospital or the ED. And that gets paid for. So that's why we do it, because that's what we get compensated to do. What we don't get compensated to do is put a lot of resources and support in keeping people safe and independent with a good quality of life at home. There's no money for that. If you do, if your parents had not saved right. yeah, I mean, that a million dollars, with, yeah, three hundred thousand, they'd year, be on right. a, on, in a Medicaid-funded okay. nursing There's home no. with no personal care right. aides. Because where does the money go? To the hospital, mm -hmm. to the procedures, to the ED. Because that's what the law of the land says. It's not because people are greedy and insisting that people go there. It's that's the only stuff that gets paid for. So of course that's where people end up, because there's no money to pay for the other stuff. Because our society has, you know, made a decision. I mean, right. after, you think after World War II, everything was, you know, was focused on this system. We didn't do like a lot of European countries and say yeah. we're going to invest in national health insurance. We're going to look at social welfare programs and and develop uh, what what we might think are better types of homes or other alternatives to keep people at home longer. Um, we, don't want, we didn't want to be taxed in, in, the, in the way that those European countries are. Um, and we still don't, obviously. And um, our, in some ways now we have this, this history that people, you know, Americans can't even think of some alternative. It seems so horrible, you know, any other way to do it. National health, how, what, what do you mean we're going to give health care to all increased access? That's, you know, as if, you know, I think, you know, many, Situation. I mean, I can't imagine anyone. Maybe that's that's my own personal bias thinking. Like, <laughs> wouldn't we want to have? But, but it seems it seems obvious. Wouldn't we want to give access to everyone? Um, and of course, as you're saying, why aren't we? You know, why aren't we giving the focus on on the prevention or the home care and keeping people independent? And you know, I know your mother unfortunately suffered the risk of of that hip surgery. But you know, most people will come out of that and not. She she's unfortunately the I don't know what percentage, you know, but I would think a very small percentage of people that unfortunately it didn't work for her. Um, and so you can't blame a system you need that to tried. to your mic off calling. your neck. Am I going this way? <laughs> Sorry. It's pushing into my chest, okay? <laughs> it could be dangerous. It could be very dangerous now. <laughs> I want a surgeon to cut that out now. Uh, before I thought I was giving you a trick. <laughs> yeah, get a trick. There you go. <laughs> so it's the hazard of public speaking. But, um, and so, yeah, so our system is, you know, a totally system, you know, not healthcare, social system, everything 
is about that. And it just, it makes a difference. And as you was talking about those, the giving that information, ta having those difficult conversations, but making it not difficult, making it part of, isn't it part of life? Isn't, you know. Um, it's a, it should yeah. be universal, just like when, it should be like part of getting a driver's license. It should mm -hmm. be something that every person is encouraged and eat, and sort of required to to make an opt out decision if they don't want to make a decision, mm -hmm. that that they would have to say I don't want to make a decision, um, because we, for good and ill, are a country built on respect for persons and the rights of individuals to determine what will be done with their own body. I think just about everybody in this room wants that power. Doesn't want someone else deciding what's best for you. You want to decide what's best for you. And you know, be very careful about wishing for a system that takes that, that power away. Mm -hmm. um, but then given that we're a system that relies on, to a fault, patient self-determination mm -hmm. and expressions of autonomy, well then we better find out what people want and what matters most to them. Because the default, when we don't know, is maximal possible prolongation of life. And again, it's an appropriate default. It's an appropriate default. We don't want people making, especially like 26-year-old interns and residents, making quick decisions about whose life is worth investing in and whose isn't. Seriously, it's very risky. And um, that's why we need to shift some of that responsibility about shared social resources onto ourselves mm -hmm. as citizens, you know, as a collective community. Because the healthcare system is kind of just doing what it's told in a way. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not evil. It's, it's, lo it's working very logically in the system that it's, that it's designed um, and how it's compensated and what the regulations are. And, um, how doctors and nurses and social workers are trained. Um, all these things are changeable, fungible. If we as a society demand, have a more positive vision of the good. I think one of the things that I think is really problematic is that we all think the way it is, is the way it has to be. Because we don't know any different, because we've never lived in France or Canada or countries that invest multiples of what we invest in social supports in the community. We've never lived in a country with a rational health care system, so we don't know what it looks like, and in fact, all those have been demonized. So we don't, we think it's as good as it can be, and it's bad, and that's the way it has to be, and anyway, it's America, so we have the best health care system in the world. <laughs> but we really don't. We have among the worst in developed nations, even for the upper middle class, as you heard here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my view is that the way that this is a political process and that the public has got to get both angry about the way it is and have a positive vision of the good to work towards and get mobilized, because without political pressure, on our elected representatives, this system will not change. Right now, the only pressures on our elected representatives are from who? American medical system. Well, but no. The chemotherapy makers, the pharmaceutical industry, hospital, the American Hospital Association. I mean, they lobby 24-7. Where are we? Nowhere to be found. So. I don't know that it should surprise us that the components of our economy that do very well in the current system are very strongly incented not to change it. And they work really hard to prevent change, whereas the rest of us are sitting around complaining, but not doing anything. And until we rise up and really start to use our political power, it's not going to change because the people who are using their political power are perfectly happy with the system as it is right now and are investing. Healthcare invests, I think, is the first 
the healthcare industry, the medical industrial complex, is either first or second in the amount spent on lobbying. I think it might be the financial services industry that's first, and healthcare is second. Why? Because some people are doing really well, and they want to continue doing really well, and there's no counterforce. So, so my intention in the next 10 years is to launch a public awareness campaign about a, what is the positive vision of the good so that people know, know what they should be demanding. You know, you tried to find palliative care in geriatrics. Was this at Penn? They have both. So you were misled. You were misled, yeah. It wasn't at Penn. It wasn't oh, okay. at Penn. I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> so here's a take, quick take home yeah. message. Mm -hmm. Don't let your loved one go anywhere that doesn't have a hospital palliative care team. <laughs> I mean, that's the simple, pragmatic find out. And there's a website called getpalliativecare.org where you can put in your city and see where they are. But that is a huge layer of protection in situations like this. And families have to demand it. The other thing you can do as a family is make sure that conversations about what ifs occur before the what if happens. And um, you know, this is an upper middle class educated audience. And we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. And this is clearly in these two stories about the family. We talked about the individual and making sure the person understands that choice, but the family. And, and I, I love that metaphor about the hand, about, you know, like why, you know, there's these different physicians, but no one's talking and no one's saying, and seeing obviously your parent as a person, you know, this integrated whole, not just the liver or the lungs or what have you, but but looking at that person and then person in the context of that family and helping everyone um, to understand what's going on and help people really make choices together and not out of guilt that, oh yeah, I'm in America. I mean, here's, we have the best. I can get this trach or this vent or this machine or this chemo, whatever it is, chemo, I'll get it till it kills me, you know? Uh, you know I'm, um, and I should do that. And, but how those conversations are let, how are they um, framed is so important, and that's why palliative care is, you know, is the, I think, you know, the most important thing that has happened um, in these last 30 or 40 years that, you know, we, we've worked at, that they're there. They're not there enough. They're not in every place. They should be um, because it's a place also where they can find that and help with that coordination of, yes, the liver doctor saying this, this one saying that, but this is what's going to happen. This is, you know, what do, what is the real goals here? And everyone understands and, and can feel comfortable. We all, you know, we all have um, a lifetime of a family history. It's not always simple. We're not all sitting around like the Brady Bunch talking <laughs> to each other and, you know, oh, this is, you know, uh, but, you know, that's that's okay. I mean, that's those are the types of clinicians there that can really help with those um, difficult family situations and. And you know, I have to say, you know, I applaud Diane and all the efforts that she's done in, in, in really moving that forward. Um, we really have made a tremendous difference. And as you can see, this passion about now, she's like, okay, we created something really good, but you know, <laughs> it's bigger than us now. We've got to get out. And that's when I started out with the frustration about geriatrics. And we started out in geriatrics. And I mean, the sad thing to tell all of you is that, um, you know, we have not produced enough people. You know, we were the people that, that started out, then we became the, you know, the faculty, the professors, and we were supposed to, um, you know, bring in the masses of medical students and nursing students that were going to be in geriatrics. We failed. And, I, you know, there were many foundations that helped support us, and the government supported us in many ways. Um, but there's a take home yeah. message yeah. here young people do not want to work with old people. Yeah. So that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody, it is, well, I mean, I think, but we have to think about that uh, in terms of, and I, I would like there to be more exchange with the audience, if that's okay. Um, but I think we have to think about what kind of society, what are the ends of our society? What kind of society do we want to live in? Because our healthcare system is the reflection of those values. Mm -hmm. 
And our society is about youth, beauty, independence, my way or the highway, frail old people who can't remember things and need help to get through the day, terrifying in a society that only values the opposite. So I, you know, I think, again, we do need to do a little bit of looking inwards. A lot of looking inwards. Is this on? No. no. Is it? No. no. Bear up? <laughs> well, we'll get on a sec. Uh, I'll shout uh, so loud that you can even be heard on that mic for, for you. Uh, but um, I wanted to ask, uh, we're going to go to the audience in a second, and we will have a mic that works, so be ready to ask questions. Thank you. Um, is there a contradiction, though, between the, the notion that individuals, everybody should have a right to decide for themselves what they want to do, and, and that, yeah. Is, is there a contradiction between the notion that everybody should have a right to decide for themselves and the notion of a, of a national health care policy and so forth. Can that policy be based on that in the long term? Or should there be r rather long-term social norms? I mean, you know, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, that's the tension in every developed society, right? right? Between trying to deliver health care on a budget and what is potentially an infinite demand mm -hmm. for more health care interventions from the population. And that's why it does come down to what are our values as a society. Do we, do we think that the well-being of the whole, the collective, is important? And if you look at our political environment at present, a very substantial fraction of Americans don't think the well-being of the whole is a worthy value. Mm -hmm. A very substantial 50% of the electorate does not buy into that social value. Mm -hmm. um, now, I would argue that it's been marketed out of them, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but it's, we have a real political challenge here because mm -hmm. other, in other countries, there is an understanding that these are common, that this is the commons, that the healthcare system is the commons, and that if certain subsets of the commons suck up all the resources, there's nothing left for everyone else. And there, there's a kind of an awareness without question about that, even as people seek better care for themselves. Okay. In this country, there is no awareness of the commons. Yeah. I had, uh, on the radio the other day, you and I uh, were both on Brian Lair, and at one point I said, and I just want to pursue this a little bit further, and then we'll go out to the audience. I had said that, that uh, in, 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 uh, uh, it's in the paragraph here, and it's somewhat uh, hyperbolic and intentionally uh, provocative, but I said we're at some point we're going to be in a society where you can either have a country that has five hip operations uh, or you can be a country that has primary school. That at some point we're going to, we're going, I mean, that, that at some point as the baby boom generation gets older and older, uh, we're go if we don't have a conversation that figures this out, we're going to, we're going to have that problem. And you disagree with that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so, 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 so articulate I that. I want to go back to what I yeah. mean. What uh, Diane started out with saying that if we really ask people what they want, that there's only that ten percent probably who would. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not having that conversation and not talking about it. I don't think that. Right. I mean, a question I'm, I'm a question I'm asking. Event, you know, like a question I'm asking is is. Uh, I mean, I that may that may be true that ninety percent will, but but a, a push comes to shove. At, at particular moments, you may end up getting, I mean, and by the way, uh, this is to some degree an upper middle class conversation. Mm -hmm. if, if, if some kid in, in South Bronx uh, says that I want everything done, it's not going to get done. Right. I mean, we're already rationing. So, so, and, and I, so I guess another way of putting this is uh, that, that this is not what kind of system uh, you know, we should have a system. We have a system, mm -hmm. and whether this is the right system. And I so totally forth. agree. It's right. the wrong system. I mean, right. the healthcare system is driven by profit. Mm -hmm. um, everything about it is designed to maximize income to the various players. Mm -hmm. um, rationally, you know, if a nursing home doesn't have enough money to pay their staff, they're going to close. Mm -hmm. 
If a hospital doesn't have enough money to meet payroll, and by the way, the healthcare industry provides 20% of the jobs in this country. So we close a hospital, we close a nursing home, we just have a whole bunch of unemployed people. So I mean, everyone is behaving rationally. It's, in order to change this, it's going to require a lot of disruption. I mean, the employment, health systems and hospitals are a major employer in this country. If we start removing resources, closing hospitals, and shifting resources to home care and community care, a lot of people who have abs will, not, will not be employed, will not have a job. Or we're gonna have to invest a huge amount of money in retraining those people mm -hmm. to deliver care where people live. How, you know, the political process that's gonna be necessary to make that happen, again, requires the people. I, I would argue the by the industry will do everything it can to prevent the change. By the way, and I would say that the industry is acting entirely rationally too. Totally. Which is to say that the president of the pharmaceutical company is bribing the, le the politicians so that all of you in your 401ks will have your, your profits higher and higher. And, and I mean, so it's all, uh, by the way, I mean, a, a real note here is since Citizens United. The, the, way you, the way you solve this is you don't allow the industry to have lobbyists and so forth. And you find ways of, of, of reining that in, but, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a whole system above that. Anyway, let, let's open it up to some questions from the audience, and, but wait till you get a microphone. So let's start over there. Um. Hi, thank you very much. This has been really informative so far. Um, I was wondering if either of you could say something about the effectiveness of, of what we do have in place. So when conversations happen, when advanced directives and living wills are in place, the extent to which um, those wishes are acted out, um, or how we might learn more about that if we don't know about it. So it's really complicated. Um, I wish it were simple. It's complicated because what somebody says five years earlier even a year earlier, about what they would want in a real situation today may not be particularly relevant. So, so for example, somebody shows up with a living will that says, I never want to be on a ventilator. So say I, I'm in the ED and I see that if you were on a ventilator for three days, there's a pretty good chance you could go back to your prior quality of life. But your living will says no ventilator. So I ignore your living will. I err on the side of giving you a shot at returning to your prior quality of life and function. And in retrospect, you would be glad I did that. So this is the problem, that it's impossible to anticipate the complexity and the nuances of the actual situation. So what's useful? What's useful is appointing someone to make decisions on your behalf if you can't make decisions that you trust. That should be a universal. That's critical, because that person can talk to me in the ED. And I can say to that person, I know your mom said she never wanted to be on a ventilator, but here's why I think it's worth doing. What do you think? And then there's a real-time communication about it. The other form of advanced directive that's really useful that is now legal in New York State is something called Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment that applies Called what? Medical, most, medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. And this is only for people whose prognosis is a year or two, who we would not be surprised if they died within a year or two. And it's actual orders that have to be followed at the nursing home by the 911 emergency medical techs. And it, the, you can choose, I want everything, CPR, ICU, hospital, I want to go to the hospital, but I don't want CPR, and I don't want ICU. I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to stay home and have care focused on my comfort. And once that thing is signed, those are medical orders that have to be followed. And is that in a registry, or how, how does the doctor find out about it? Well, it's, it's, it's printed in heavy pink paper stock. Seriously, it's in like your wallet fluorescent or it? pink. No, and you should, you should laminate it or put it in a plastic thing. And you take it with you everywhere you go. Now, some states have a registry. So if you call 911 and an ambulance comes, they can actually find you on the registry. 
and your medical orders for life-sustaining treatment are there. And it may say, Mr. Jones wants everything, CPR, intubation, ICU, and that person will go straight to the ED, get intubated, and go upstairs. Again, 90% don't choose that. Can you imagine the political controversy if we demand a registry? Well, 18 Everybody's registered, the 18, government knows what everybody wants. Yeah, 18 states are doing this, mm -hmm. and more and more passing these laws all the time, precisely because of recognition of the disaster that families like the, the two that, we heard right, about we heard are going through. Yet, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing that mm -hmm. neither of you have ever heard of this, yeah. the Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. No one ever talked to you about it? I, there was a lot of, like, people, my father and mother were offered, do you want to be registered? You know, do you want CPR? Do you right. want? They were giving me. Uh, so yes, no, thing. yeah, no, it's not it's the same always, thing. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 Let's go for another question. Let's see. Uh, back, back there, the woman in black. Thank you. It's been very interesting. You mentioned the, the two choices that people could have right now, which is do everything possible to extend my life, or the second option, don't do everything and just give me comfort care, and about 5 or 10% off for do everything, and more people off for that. That's only in the situation where someone is, has permanent loss of the ability to interact with loved ones. But this is the question you're asking people in yeah, advance. Yeah, I'm asking them to envision a situation right. Right. where they're permanently impaired and not going to get better. Right. Under that circumstance, do they want... And you're having that conversation with 35-year-olds and 40-year-olds. I'm having that conversation with every patient I have. Right. So what I think would be interesting to even extend that and have a third option, which is to actively choose the blue pill to exit easily type of option, you know, the euthanasia, suicide. Oh, oh. And this may be a place we're not ready to go, but I think it loops back to your interesting thing about the economics of trying to sustain everybody. And even if only 5 or 10 percent of the people chose that blue pill exit early option, it would certainly help with the economics of having to sustain all the baby boomers. In. And that goes right at the heart of your entire training as a doctor. Yeah. I, it, yeah. So but the given problem, that you're going to yeah, die within, yeah. like, honestly, I've been through this with both my parents, too, and so I know something about it as well. Right now, you can choose that, but the only option, there's no, we talk about comfort care. Mm -hmm. I've been through comfort care. It sounds really nice and comforting. Comfort care is not that great. Depends <laughs> on who gives it. Yeah. It's it morphine. depends on the quality of the team. It's basically morphine, and it can go on for a while, and if you want to exit, which is what my dad chose, it's starvation. You have to refuse all food. That's the only way. Yeah. So that's where we're at as a society. You can starve yourself and get morphine to get you through it. Mm -hmm. There's no other easier option. And it would be great. There, I know people, again, my father would have chosen this and my mom's going to go now, that would choose this option if it were an option. Mm -hmm. So I just think it would be interesting to see, again, as a society, us to go to the next level and make that a possibility. Well, Di Diane, let me focus that a little bit because that is precisely the blue pill option goes against everything you are trained as a doctor, and yet, on the other hand, you have a conversation with people, what do you want? I, I want the blue pill. I do pill. not have a moral opposition to that, because, because we are a very self-determination, autonomy-driven country. So it's your life and your death, and I don't have a moral um, re uh, objection to that. I do worry about public policy. How so? Why do I worry about public policy? Because we are in a system where scarcity is the driving principle in healthcare now. All anybody is talking about, especially if you're in Medicare Advantage, which is a, basically a managed care organization under Medicare, or Medicaid managed care, which is putting poor people into a managed care situation, it's all about spending less money. The less money they spend, the more money they make. And when you put people, patients in a situation like that where it's about profit, Medicare Advantage is owned by Oxford and Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield and Aetna and United Healthcare, their bottom line is their quarterly report to shareholders. The best way that they can make a profit is by providing less care to you. Providing easy ways out for people fits, aligns very nicely with their financial goals. So it makes me nervous. 
because the only people who are frankly interested in assisted suicide or euthanasia are the upper middle class highly educated. If you look at who opts for this in Oregon, who opts for this in Washington, who opts for it in Montana, and you know, more and more states are legalizing this, it is only the educated and the wealthy. That should give us some pause. Just, just, uh, just to repeat what you're saying, maybe it's because they're old enough to understand. Uh, she said smart enough to understand. Uh, or, no, smart, yeah. I'm sorry, smart enough to understand. Yeah. Uh, another thing, by the way, and I love arguing against myself, it's my favorite thing, uh, <laughs> is, is if you go away from the social policy, the, the big problem with the blue pill is families. You know, damn it, I want your million dollars. Take the goddamn blue pill. Take the goddamn blue pill. Take the goddamn blue pill. The goddamn blue pill. And, and, and that's complicated too. So I mean, it, it's not as though, well, the blue pill is no panacea to this problem. It, it, it raises all kinds of other concerns. But having said that, maybe they're valid concerns. I have concerns, I think, that we have even with those other options. Because as you carefully restructure my question, it's very much about the person needs to decide what they want. If it's the person needs to decide what they want, it's very much about the person needs to decide what they want. Even in the other ones, we had the battle with, I had the battle with my mom over the, the no resuscitation thing. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Uh, let's see, we've got a question over here. It may be that you've already answered this question, but when I was a kid, I learned that Eskimos put their elders on ice floes. <laughs> and maybe others have heard that too, and I thought that was terrible. I thought that was really awful. How could anybody do that? I'm reconsidering that now. And again, you know, this, is this a blue pill? And is this something, did the, you know, what, what happened in those Eskimo societies? Were, was it a general consensus that this person needed to go out on the ice floe, and did that person agree? And what kind of death is that? One, one of the things we, in a later session, Sharon, you're gonna, we're going to be talking anthropologically, cross section about what other people do. So we have our ice floe person over here. <laughs> and, uh, oh, so, 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 so come back. I think rather than answer that question here, uh, come back to hear Sharon Ice Flow Kaufman uh, a little bit later. Let's see uh, who has the next one. Yeah, okay, orange shirt here. Uh, this question for uh, uh, Mr. Weschler here. Um, uh, you were talking about um, that we uh, may have reached the point where uh, it's either eight hip surgeries or uh, public schools. Can, can you hear what he's saying? No. You is that working? Is that mic working? Can you hear me now? No. Just talk loudly and I'll repeat if it doesn't. Okay. Uh, I think you were, uh, uh, you were saying that we may have reached the point where choice between eight hip surgeries uh, five public schools yeah five right right surgeries, I think. I was wondering how you could say that you know in a society that can spend two trillion dollars on you know has that money for for defense for, 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 for an aircraft carrier for Afghanistan and yeah Iraq. yeah um, yeah mm -hmm. and I'd also like to hear you were talking uh, I'm sorry Name. Diane and, Diane and, and Liz. Uh, for some other healthcare systems, for example, in France and Europe, where they are able to do that, and how economically are they able to uh, do that the way they can? So, so let me just repeat the question very quickly. Uh, a very good question to me is is how I can make that dichotomy between the five hip operations and the and 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 the primary school when we have. Uh, trillions for wars and, and aircraft carriers and so forth. I think that's completely valid. Uh, and then uh, having said that, you know, we have to have that entire conversation. And we are in a country that spends trillions on wars. And, and, and by the way, I wasn't saying we're at that point now. I'm saying when the baby boom generation gets to be a certain age. And I, I do actually think that, I mean, I, 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 I've been reading the articles that talk about that as a huge problem. Uh, uh, and uh, then you were at, to Diane was the question, how does France do it, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, one reason is that they don't go to two wars for trillions of dollars, but go ahead. What? Well, they don't have a profit-driven healthcare system. Um, and they pay substantially more in taxes, but 
I don't know if you watch Sicko. If you haven't, you should. Michael Moore's no. movie, in which it's very clear that they have a much better standard of living than we do, in spite of the fact that they're paying 50% of their income in taxes because they are not paying for anything else. They're not, you know, paying for health insurance that has a $5,000 deductible and a copay of X, Y, Z, and they are not paying for private school. And um, you know, three hundred thousand dollars. There's a year all for, different yeah. things. Yes. You know, they they take eight weeks of vacation a year, more. Um, which the quality of life is much higher in other countries. Um, and the far, like, one of the first things so, that happens in, a, in 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 all of these countries is that then they set prices for drugs um, so that you can't get away with charging some outrageous amount of money in France and Netherlands. It, those prices are set by the government. It's a negotiated price and that's it. Um, it isn't free market. But not here. But not here. So here they can we charge We are prohibited by here. law. Mm -hmm. The government is prohibited by statute from negotiating prices with pharmaceutical companies. How so did we that pay a hundred times more than Canada for the yes, same drug. Well, you know, how do they develop their drugs? It's on taxpayer-funded NIH research. Yeah. It's a whole thing is a money, a money cycle. Can you just quickly describe what happens to uh, someone in, uh, in France in, in Nancy's parents' situation, the, the, the two 90-year-old parents? Support is provided at home. The, like I said, the amount of social service support as opposed to acute care hospital ED support is a multiple, many fold, multiple. And so, so for example, do you, have you guys heard of Cicely Saunders? Nope. She was the founder of the hospice and palliative care movement in England. She founded hospice, um, St. Christopher's Hospice, and she died a couple years ago. And I went to visit her because she's like the icon of the movement. Um, and I visited her when she was dying of cancer at home, where she was living in her home she'd been living in for 50 years, which had, her bedroom was on an upper floor. She had a tuck-in service. The government paid for someone to come and get her up in the morning, bathe her, dress her, get her down the stairs, get her breakfast, and then they left. And then they came back again at like eight or nine o'clock and put her to bed. We can't get that in this country. When she needed, you know, to be bathed, two people came because that was a two-person assist. The system was designed to promote her independence and her quality of life. So it was a sort of just-in-time resources. That's what they do in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, Canada. Resources go to the patient and the family to meet personal care needs. We don't pay for those here. We pay for the five fingers of the hand. We the pay lung doctor, for the, the ED, the ambulance, the hospitalization, the 18 specialists. So that's what we get. Um, can you uh, uh, just, uh, we'll go back uh, one, more, one or two more questions, but can, can you, uh, you've, we keep talking about palliative care, and so I'm not clear that everybody knows exactly what that means. Go and do fun. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if, if we've been clear. <laughs> Well, first, I'm going to start with the word hospice because a lot of people, when they say palliative care, they think it means hospice, and then hospice has gotten this um, reputation. That hospice means the the very end somehow, and um, and the morphine shots or something like that, which always makes me really um, brings my pressure up. Um, but palliative care is about treating the symptoms of your illnesses, so it can happen at the same time if you choose to have aggressive care um, for your cancer or for any of your other illnesses. So it's about managing symptoms. And part of those symptoms um, that you've been hearing about, that management is around, it could be comfort care and really focusing on how to, how to treat those symptoms so that you're more comfortable. So the nausea or the, the um, the diarrhea for, or the other dip, and I'm going to just say where because there are difficult things that happen when you have treatments or you have chronic illnesses. So it's a focus on treating those symptoms. Yeah, I mean it's 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 focused on quality of life, mm -hmm. not as an either or, not as either you get quantity or you get quality, but both. 
So I'll give you an example of a 24-year-old we took care of with a new diagnosis of leukemia. And um, leukemia nowadays, thanks to modern medicine in 24-year-olds, is curable with bone marrow transplant about three quarters of the time, about 70% of the time. So what the goal of care for this young woman, Kate, was cure. But she had horrible existential, spiritual, financial, she had no insurance, um, pain from a marrow packed with immature white blood cells, shortness of breath for the same reason, um, panic attacks, full-blown panic attacks. So the oncologist showed up five minutes every morning to check her counts and write an order for the chemotherapy. The palliative care team was there three or four hours a day to help this family come to terms with this disaster, to figure out how to get emergency Medicaid, to treat the pain, to treat the shortness of breath, to treat the panic attacks. Our social worker and chaplain were there daily. So Kate was cured, but attributes her survival to us, to the palliative care team. Um, so, so, so you see why you need both. Who has the microphone right now? Where, where is it? Okay, uh, let's see, uh, go over to the guy with the, uh, in the back over there. And then we'll do, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, wait, I just want, I want you to run, I want to, Jack, run. Go, Jack, go. While Jack is running, applause for Jack. And also for Stephanie over here who is, who put this whole thing together. So, okay, there you go. Uh, more states have been adopting assisted suicide laws, uh, most recently Vermont. Um, do you think this is going to become a routine option uh, nationwide? Uh, and do you think it's a good option to have among the other things that you've described, like palliative care? I would feel a lot more comfortable about it being a universal option if we had universal access to health care. So I'm nervous about it. I'm nervous about it because of the burdens on families of caring for disabled members of their family, the pressure on old people to get out of the way. The, the option creates the pressure. So I'm nervous about it. So It'll be the will of the people either way, though, because these are all ballot initiatives. They're all state by state ballot initiatives, and most of them in other states that have failed have come very, very close to passing. So. You know, that seems to be the tendency even in red states like Montana. So without the necessary safeguards that you mentioned, do you think it should be prohibited? I'm really of two minds about it. I'm, I'm you know, I ha I've, I'm really of two minds about it. I've taken care of enough people for whom that option was would really have helped and they really wanted it and they were forced to stop eating and drinking. And that was horrible. Mm -hmm. Yes. On the other hand, it's a very tiny minority of the population that wants that. Tiny, tiny, and privileged minority. Um, more vulnerable people might feel pressured. Let's take one more question. And uh, so the woman in the black and the white sweater there. The rest of you later on, don't worry, you'll get asked too. Thanks. Um, <laughs> So I want to know what the banner is to march under. Mm -hmm. I want to know what the movement is, and I want to get involved. And I'm not a social worker. I'm not a nurse. Um, but I, I'm, like, I'm like desperately wanting to do something about this is my first question. Mm -hmm. And my second is, is there, a, is there a country with a blueprint close enough to our own that we could start sort of, that people are starting to riff off of so that we could start changing things without freaking people out about, you know, how they need to change? What should we, what country should we be looking at that has a system close enough to ours that, that we could be learning from? Um. So, Canada, but you, where you can find information on this is on the Commonwealth Fund website, okay. which does very um, clear and concise comparative analyses 
between other first world developed nations that are comparable to ours in terms of standard of living and industrialization and so on, and, and what we do in comparison to them. So I think those are the models. The problem is the political dialogue in this country absolutely prohibits modeling ourselves after any other country. We are ab completely nationalistic in this regard. And if you even suggest that they do it well or better in another country, your head gets cut off in the press. So everyone knows we're not allowed to do that. The Affordable Care Act, the new law that passed under oh, President Obama, starts to move us very, very slowly because the political profit forces prevented it from moving any faster in the direction that European and Commonwealth nations are in, that is, starting to pay for things that matter and are meaningful to patients and families instead of just paying infinitely for things that make profit. What is the banner? Others. Well, we don't have a banner yet. And I think this is one of the things I'm thinking about, is what is the coalition? Who should be in? Why isn't AARP doing this? Um, what, you know, where, what, who's going to form the coalition? Where's the funding going to come from? There is no organization that's doing this. And the f the fact of the that's matter, what though, I'm thinking yeah. about all the time, because we need that. The fact of the matter, though, is that when Obama sat down and started getting ready to do the medical thing, mm -hmm. the poll says 70% favored universal health care. Mm -hmm. So it's not a country that it is, in fact, not a country that is immune to this approach. What happened, frankly, under Obama was that the first people he negotiated with were the pharmaceuticals and so forth and said, don't worry. I mean, what the trouble is we have a right wing Democrat president who wasn't going, to, which is the best we can get, no. who wasn't going to be willing to have that conversation. No, but the fact is that, that we are not, that we are not a country that, that is opposed to this. Law would not have passed had he not placated yes. all these industrial forces. Had it definitely stronger. would not have passed. It was the best he could get in this political environment. So in other words, the fact that 70% Irrelevant. favorite. They don't but, 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 but we shouldn't be saying, we, should, we shouldn't be defeatist and say that we're a country that, that oh, yeah. as a country, is against doing this. As a country, we want to do this. Yeah. We, the and, political and forces. And 90% of doctors want, 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 want it, too. Health care, too. I think what we're hearing is that people, I think people get it, that, yeah, we spend a lot of money, and what are we really getting is mm -hmm. part of also that argument that people are having. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to the other thing about what Commonwealth has been looking, you know, at the foundation, you want to look at that website. One of the countries is the Netherlands because it has um, an insur it has an insurance company basis and, and they don't have total universal health. It's about 95 or 97 percent. But of course, it's also balanced with a huge social welfare system in which um, you're not worried about. Um, I, I, I try to describe to my family who, you know, who are just regular Americans who were like, what, what does this all mean? I said, well, what if you didn't have to worry about your children and the schools they were in, but also not have to worry about your parents and the quality of the places? I mean, whatever, I'm sure your, your parents have been into wonderful nursing homes or assisted living, yes or no. I mean, it's so varied in this country, and I think that's what people are very upset about. Um, where is this great U.S. standard. It's, you know, maybe somebody gets it or so everybody's like, well, tell me the best place to go or, um, what am I, or I have to go to the hospital with the palliative care service or the geriatric service. What does that mean? That we don't even have a standard to say, what should every place have? Um, that's what I think people are getting um, upset about. And I think that's why they were ready finally to say, yeah, maybe we need to, to do something differently. And. Uh, well, listen, we're about to take a break, but what, one thing I want to do before we take the break is something that happened on, the, uh, on Brian's show. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, we were on Brian Lair yesterday, and somebody, a nurse, called in. And, uh, and since you're the only nurse, nurse okay. representative that I'll we're going to have here, you'll yeah. represent nurses, okay. right. but you said something important about, uh, just about how nurses are really where, where this happens in the society right now. Nurses are the front line of protection for patients and families. Um, and they need more power and authority to exert that protection. But um, my industry, my profession, is fighting tooth and nail to prevent that. Um, but you know, nurses are the ones at the bedside. Doctors are running around, you know, sitting at computers. Um, nurses are the ones who actually know the human being and know the human being's family, and they need to be empowered 
to have these conversations with patients and families. And that's one of the most difficult things I can tell you in any of the work that I've been doing. I have a network of 450 hospitals that are part of our group. And um, you know, we have all these surveys and, and, and the comments, the voices from the nurses. I was called the, the aftermath of the physician um, family patient conversation. They, they deal with the aftermath because then the physician leaves and the family looks and says, well, what was that about? What did that mean? And I guess we're supposed to have the surgery or that's the right thing, that's the right, and the, and the nurse is trying to sort of skirt around and say, well, here's the different choices, this is what they were saying, but without, you know, you don't want to not give people hope, too. I mean, it, but yet they're, they're, they're dealing with that issue. Do I say, well, well the physician, maybe you need to talk to another doctor? I mean, they try, that's the conversation they try to do is try to go around it and say, well, why don't you speak to, I guess in your case, the cardiologist or the other doctor that was willing to say maybe that surgery wasn't necessary or that, that diagnostic um, procedure. So um, it's a very difficult situation that nurses are placed in because they're there 24 hours at that bedside or the ones in the community visiting people in their homes and seeing those situations or in the nursing homes. And, you know, they're watching it and with, a, with a different eye, with a different lens to say, you know, wait. I, I, I guess coming full circle, could we imagine the nurses to be at the forefront of that banner? Uh, if, if, as opposed to doctors, that nurses may be the ones who really lead us out of this? It's going to be both. It's got to be gotta, together. Gotta be we both. all have to be together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we all have to be together, but that means we all have to go to lunch. So, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> so why don't we say we'll start at... Uh, thank them. Thank all of you. We'll come back here at 1.35 and we'll start up again. Thank you so much.